welcome to the Disabled Poets Prize Awards 2024 and thank you so much for coming along. This is the second year of the prize, which was founded by myself with Spread the Word, Cryptic Arts and the Poetry Press. We would like to extend our thanks to the Authors Licensing and Collecting Society for supporting the prize this year, as well as everyone who has donated, and also to the continued support of the Literary Consultancy and the Arvon Foundation, who have donated prizes. And I'll talk more about those in a moment. When we founded the prize, it was in recognition of the fact that deaf and disabled poets often lose out on industry opportunities due to disabled barriers, and their work often doesn't receive the prominence it deserves. From inaccessible submission processes to events without access provisions, we struggle to receive the profile we need for our work to move forward to the next level. The prize highlights and celebrates the incredible work being produced by disabled poets across the UK. Running the prize for the first time last year, the quality of the work submitted really showed how vital and valuable the prize is. It was fantastic to see the publication of The Still Point by Catherine Moss, winner of last year's Best Unpublished Pamphlet category, last November by Verve Poetry Press. The 2024 strand, the 2024 prize had three strands, Best Single Poem, judged by myself and Stephen Lightbound, Best Unpublished Pamphlet, judged by myself and Pascal Petit, and Best Poem Performed in British Sign Language, judged by Kabir Kapoor. We received over 160 entries to this year's prize, which was very exciting. The work received was exceptional, deft, intricate poetry that issued from the perspective of being disabled while reaching out to explore universal themes and ideas. This event's readings will demonstrate a vision of future poetry. And I now want to move on to the announcement for uh, best single poem. In this prize, we're looking for the best unpublished single poem by a deaf or disabled writer. We longlisted 12 poets and shortlisted six of those, each of whom will receive free membership to the literary consultancies being a writer community platform and an online professional development session with Cryptic Arts and Spread the Word. Three of the six shortlisted poems were highly commended and have been awarded a £50 prize. These three poems and poets were, in no particular order, Elizabeth Gibson for Could This Be How to Love, Vera Ewan for Ward 9, and Dee Dickens for A Horse Walks Into a Bar after Tyrone Lewis. The linguistically playful A Horse Walks Into a Bar combines a joy in wordplay with brutal cl clarity of meaning. The tightly structured Ward 9 is commanding in its construction of visual metaphor. And Could This Be How to Love is an intimate and generous gift to the reader, tender and sensitive. Before we make the announcements for the best single poem category and have readings from the three place poets, I'd like to introduce my fellow judge, Stephen Lightbound, to share his thoughts on this year's submissions. Stephen. Thank you, Jamie. Um, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to Jamie and Spread the Word for asking me to be a judge for the Disabled Poets Prize 2024. It's been a huge honour to be part of this year's prize, and I want to congratulate not only the winners and shortlisted entries, but to every poet who submitted a poem. I know it's easy for judges to say that the standard of a prize they were involved in was incredibly high, but I do want to say that and genuinely mean it. The standard was incredibly high. As a disabled poet myself, prizes like this are crucial. I do believe that disabled poets are, for various reasons, not given the same platform or opportunities as other poets. So prizes like this have to exist. They encourage people to write, they showcase excellence in poetry and they enable people to write about topics that may not ordinarily be showcased. I found the judging process incredibly moving. The emotion, skill and determination that was evident in every line, every place word, every title was palpable. These poems were raw, physical and visceral. Many touched on similar themes, 
that of oppression, feeling alienated, not welcome in today's society, of frustrations at our bodies, the world around us and systems designed to keep us down, of memories, fears and a desire to break free, of pride, warmth and humour, of strength, of strength, courage and determination. The three place poems, Eating an Orange, Blue Monday and Dark Matter were truly remarkable poems and I think you'll agree, worthy of their placings. Over the course of the judging process, I read many, many poems, but these three merited further reads, each time bringing new meanings and life to the words on the page. These poems stayed with me beyond the judging, and I have often found myself mulling them over when I least expect it. And writing of this quality deserves the praise and recognition that they will receive. And I am very much looking forward to hearing these poems shared by the poets themselves. This was an incredibly competitive field, but both Jamie and I agreed on the colossal merits of the three poems, and then the shortlisted poems. Often, there can be a strong debate about which poems should and should not be included, but Jamie and I mainly found ourselves debating how much we loved the poems. And once again, thank you to everyone who sent in a poem. Please do be encouraged to keep writing. I know all too well how it feels to make a poem the best it can be and then submit it with only hope to receive disappointment when it's not placed. But that doesn't mean there are not homes for these poems not selected or for future poems you may write. My hope is that magazines, collections, shelves and anthologies are full of disabled voices. So please do keep writing, keep editing and keep submitting. Poetry needs you. We need more disabled poets, and I am so very grateful to have been part of this process. This is going to be a great event, and again, I congratulate Spread the Word for their efforts in making this as, as accessible an event as can be. Far too quickly, events have come offline, alienating what was a thriving audience. The desire to be in a room, a physical space is strong, but the desire to be included, accepted and acknowledged is even stronger. So thank you for making this event happen. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Thank you so much, Stephen. And it was a pleasure to be judging with you. I completely agree with everything you've said. So in third place, awarded £150 was Dark Matter by Alex Mepham. In second place, awarded £250 was Blue Monday by Rachel Burns, and in first place, awarded £500, an online editor one-to-one -one with the Literary Consultancy, and an online masterclass with the Arvon Foundation, was Eating an Orange, by Gayathri Kamala Kandon. Um, and I'm going to ask Alex to read from, to us from Dark Matter. Thank you, Jamie. Dark Matter. It was at the age of 12 when I first met him beneath the underpass. He watched me in the mornings, walking across the linear park, but he waited until the time was right. One afternoon after a spring rain, he stopped me brought me to the bank of the brook and revealed to me what I could become. My white school shirt, a sodden paper plane, striped tie floating and unrestrained. I could take any form I wanted or even none at all. It was easy, he said, and I could make it happen at any moment, whenever the time was right. I took one step into the murky flow and he was gone, hushed in the hue of the highway. At first, I was afraid of what he taught my hands to do and undo, but steadfast he would return, not only by water, but by trains, in bottle shops and through the chattering of my kitchen knives. Yes. I have grown to know him. I know him 
very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Alex. Um, and now, if Rachel Burns could read for us. Blue Monday. After the phone call, after the police are called, after safeguarding date procedures, after cancelled appointments, after stuffing leaflets into envelopes, warm spaces, the council's bleak answer to prayer, after walking past a schoolboy, panic etched on his face as he helps an elderly man to his feet at the bus stop, men smoking outside the high crown, haunted, worn out faces, after a day of it, red letters, rent arrears, Empty prepayment meters, bailiffs, knife held to daughter's throat. Poverty is absolute. After a day of unnecessary administration and the feeling this is helping no one except a bearded man working in the DWP Department of Statistics, moving unemployed to economically inactive like matchstick figures. Ticking box after box after box, like a domino coffin run. After the working day is done, I walk around the frozen lake at dusk under the orange glow of HMP Franklin's security lights. The mud churned ground like frozen porridge. Swans, grey lags and coots barely visible, a grey heron buffed up against the sky like a priest at a requiem. That's one of those poems that really doesn't let go of you. Thank you so much for sharing it. And in first place, Gaia 3, Kamala Khandan. Eating an orange. I end the call and empty my schedule for the week. It takes seven emails and the same voice note sent to three group chats. You're not dead, not yet, which makes it harder. Harder to plan, harder to cancel, to travel, to eat. Let's say grief is an orange with an unending number of segments. How many segments do I have to eat before I get used to the taste? A hospital room, indifferent, claggy, fitting. When we wait together, I sit by your feet. You watch me with wide open eyes. I have one hand in a book of poems and one hand in yours, clutching. You do it well, this end bit of living. We share an orange in silence. The peel grafts itself new skin. The segments reform. I've blocked out 1 to 8 p.m. for this. There is something still majestic, very you, about your grip. I sing a budgeon and wow, you smile. The nurse confirms it. Perhaps segmenting an orange isn't all bad. In the family chat, I write, he definitely smiled. Then delete it. My mother and sisters are having a night off. I imagine they are bathing or dozing or otherwise engaged in leisure, miraging themselves a single orangeless dinner. Thank you 
so much for that poem. Hearing it is was really wonderful. Thank you. So it took me a moment to even ab absorb it enough to say anything. Um, what inspired you to write the poem? So the person it's about is um, like a father figure to me. And I was sat in his hospital room um, as I was writing it. And it's a sort of timeless space, a hospital room. And I wanted to sort of capture that sort of waiting and also it's it feels like the most sort of the most important and yet there's so little that you can actually do it's just to be um and the admin of you know when someone is unwell um scheduling you know who's going to be cooking the food um, who's with the person equally, who's at home uh, looking after everyone else. Um, as a family, we got really good at the admin um, and he's no longer with us. Um, yeah, so I was thinking of all of that. And that was very much the the experience it spoke to for me. So thank you for writing it. What are your future poetry plans? Yeah, um, I'm working on a verse novel um, about a non-binary Tamil teen and the sort of, oh, who do I fancy? Don't know. Everyone? No one? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is sort of in the works. That's really exciting. Um, I will definitely be be watching out for that one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and moving on to the best poem performed in British Sign Language. So this was judged by the UK's BSL poet laureate Kabir Kapoor, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. And the best poem performed in British Sign Language category is designed to raise the profile of work being created specifically by deaf poets. Limited entries were received for the category, but we're delighted to award a commendation to Sahara Khan for her poem, My Eyes, which expresses her feelings about her deafness growing up. Sahara will receive £300, an online editing one-to-one -one with the literary consultancy alongside free membership to there being a writer platform, an online masterclass by Arvon, and an online professional development session with Cryptic Arts and Spread the Word. Um, we are going to share the poem performed by Sahara in BSL, um, but first I'm going to read it in spoken English. My Eyes by Sahara Khan. Eye-born light, world. My eyes opened, but blurred. Growing up, my eyes see mother, then father, then people around me, hands, sound, voice, movement, and play. When I was illness and my parents worried and took me to hospital, doctor caught my ear. Both shut it out. My parents upset. I know aware. So I went to nursery. I saw adults and children use their sign language. I wore hearing aids. Sound nothing. Growing up, I looked at me. I am deaf and uses BSL. I looked. The hearing people use their lip for talking. Deaf people use their sign language. Growing up, dark world, the people and world around me, not very nice attitude, horrible and many. Emotion mixed, 
hits me through all my life. Got it. I identify myself that who I am. Yes. I am a real deaf and BSL. Proud. No hearing aids. My eyes. I am grateful to God dropped me here in United Kingdom. Muslim. British South Asian. Deaf. BSL. And female. My eyes. My name is Sahara Khan. I am artist. Actor. My eyes. And now, I believe Sahara is going to perform the poem in BSL. And now we move on to the best unpublished pamphlet category, which is designed to support a deaf or disabled writer in publishing their first pamphlet, with Verve Poetry Press sponsoring the award with publication of the winning pamphlet. We longlisted 12 poets and shortlisted six of these, all of whom will receive free membership to the literary consultancies being a writer community platform and an online professional development service session with Cryptic Arts and Spread the Word. 
three of the six shortlisted pamphlets were highly commended and have been awarded a £50 prize. They were, in no particular order, Erzge Gersturk for Axit Armors, Norman Miller for Learning in Nine Keys, and Dan Jobin for Scar Tissue. The beautifully expansive Exit Armors deftly uses form as it weaves through the physical and metaphysical. The impressively erudite Learning in Nine Keys lyrically entwines science and culture into a reference-rich world, and the unflinchingly honest scar tissue dances intimately and elegantly through topics, entwining politics and the personal body. Before we hear readings from the three place poets, I'd like to introduce my fellow judge, Pascal Petit, to share her thoughts on this year's submissions. Pascal will also announce the placing of the poets. It was a delight to judge with you, and I will hand over to Pascal. Thank you very much, Jamie. Hello, everyone. It was a real privilege to read the entries for the Disabled Poets Pamphlet Prize, and I'm very grateful for the insights of my co-judge, Jamie Hale, and to everyone that spread the word for your hard work to make it happen. Thank you to all the poets who trusted us with their pamphlets, some of which dealt directly with disability and illness. I was aware of the extra hurdles I face to make art. Becoming a poet is hard enough without the barrier of disability. So it was an honor to be part of such an important scheme. As well as our three winners, we highly commended three entries. Dan Jobin's Scar Tissue for its raw power. Norman Miller's revelatory and erudite learning in nine keys. And Oske Gosturk for the visceral but tender exit armors. I'm going to announce the winners backwards, starting with our third prize. Third prize winner is Amber Horn for So She Spoke, an accomplished and erudite narrative where characters from Greek myth are interwoven with contemporary life to stunning effect. We admired this pamphlet's sonic richness and ambition and the fluidity of the storytelling with no word misplaced. We could easily see this expanding into a full collection with its compelling themes and characters. Congratulations to Amber. Second prize goes to Anna Starkey for all these frequencies. This is a short collection of exciting and spirited wonderments at the world. I was hooked from the first poem to the last, laughing and marveling at the jouissance in snapshots of ordinary life made extraordinary. There are moments of likely <clears throat> there are moments of lightly handled gravitas as well among the playful vignettes. This is a moving and witty debut. Congratulations, Anna. So on to our winner, who is Susie Wilson, for the extraordinary Nowhere Near as Safe as a Snake in Bed. Congratulations, Susie. Despite the serious theme of a life-threatening condition, this sequence brims with exuberance. There is consummate control over imagery and form, which makes the poems haunting and memorable. They lingered in our minds long after reading. The poets Palpable Love of Language and the Imagination by Some Magic Spell leaves us 
feeling hopeful. We're now going to hear poems from the three prize winners. And congratulations to all of them. And thank you for that, Pascal. What lovely thoughts on all of the work. So Amber will be awarded £150 and Anna £250. Susie will be awarded £500, publication by Verve Poetry Press, an online editor one-to-one -one from the Literary Consultancy and an online masterclass by the Arvon Foundation. And to move on to the readings from their best unpublished pamphlet, in third place, I'd like to introduce Amber Horn. Helen has started playing a game where she sees how many glasses of water it takes for her stomach to slosh like a pond in a rainstorm. She is disrupting the ducks, wetting the wings of a steady dragonfly. As she rolls from side to side, drinks another litre, then continues this cycle. She tries different lines of motion. When she sits in a rocking chair, she feels it jump from somewhere below her ribs, right into her mouth, touching the small crust of plaque behind her molars. Hanging her head off the side of the bed, twisting just her torso, she listens as it rushes to her feet, fights the urge to come past, rushing past her lips. Helen imagines her body is hollow, like an egg, that as a baby, they pricked holes in both of her pinky fingers and blew until everything emptied from right to left until it was a puddle on the floor. Pulled out the paints, colored her in celebration golds and reds. Now when she eats and drinks, it falls right through. And so a body of water forms within her shell and how vast she feels echoing. And so the game changes. She wanders the halls, picking chipped edges off the walls, slipping them into her mouth, sliding them under her tongue, the seal from the milk carton, every pen lid in the mandrel, 16 birthday candle holders. She swallowed all of them, everything in sight, until the whole house is rebuilt within her. She swallowed the locked doors and the skylights, every filing cabinet she didn't get a key for. She did not swallow the men. Instead, she swallowed all the maids, invited them inside, held their hands and explained what life would be like. They walked in with packed bags. Helen wonders what the men will think when they get back from the battlefield. She giggles. She strokes the swell of her belly, the house tossing and turning within her, kicking at the edges. Thank you. Thank you so much for that gorgeous reading. And in second place, we have Anna Starkey, who is, I hope, going to read for us next. All these frequencies, lying suspended between ancient hawthorn and beech, releasing skin into their knowing arms. Slowed up hum down of midsummer wraps me in audible activity of tiny warmed bodies. Or do I hear electromagnetic earth, contented cracklings of fields exchanging energies? plain chant of as yet undiscovered forces. Above me, glints and hints of incessant dancing, wildly different beings animating layers of tree universes in simultaneous deep and now time. All these frequencies infusing me with hopeful light green leaf light till bones become branches. Thanks. 
thank you so much. I really love those last two lines. And in first place, we have Susie Wilson, um, who is going to read for us next. Over to you, Susie. Thank you. Banana Circus. Bananas in spangled coconut bras. Bananas on horseback on tips of tails, skins peeled and flipped into striped layer skirts. Bananas with teaspoons in skinny hands teeter across a high wire, balancing. Bananas boom out of a shiny cannon. One banana faking it, with a knife stuck through the middle of his fleshy parts. Somehow, all the bananas are grinning. All this documented in black and white. You spent childhood time with these bananas. You didn't believe then such things could be possible, reading the big red book on your grandparents' attic floor. But now, you want to believe in impossibles. Slip on a pair of red tails and top hat, a curly moustache, be a banana, if it would help. Become a banana ring master, cracking your whip to dismiss big cats, anything with an appetite. Thank you so much. And being one of the few people who's had the privilege of reading other work. I'm really looking forward to this. Where did you find the inspiration for the pamphlet? Um, well, I had uh, an unfortunate experience of finding out that I had melanoma, autism and ADHD, um, all discovering within a few months. And that uh, caused a kind of pause in my life as I lived through the first few stages of that cancer and also began finding my own character again um, because identification uh, or diagnosis with autism and ADHD can bring years of flashbacks and uh, re-evaluations but it's also an opportunity to adapt your life um, to yourself instead of the other way around. So I had this big pause after these inciting events and then I just started writing my way out, I suppose. Um, and what really interested me is that uh, I just found out how different I was um, because of my neurodivergence and my genes. But I also just discovered that I had something in common with everyone, namely fear of illness or death, um, being compromised or uncontrollable change. And somehow, that caused this magic trick of making my often quite tangential writing um, much more accessible. So it was inspired by the illness, um, but it's also about me becoming more of my neurodivergent self. So a typical way I deal with difficulty is to just stare it in the face and be very direct, um, very sort of autistically direct, but I also can't help seeing it as ridiculous. So the pamphlet's really about the absurdity of life. Uh, which I think we're all um, easily able to grasp. Um, and writing about this life-threatening material actually really helped me grow into a more absurdist um, and direct voice. So that that was the inspiration. I sort of couldn't not do it, but it did me a huge favour writing it. Um, and it's also about me trying to make sure I kept being the poetic me more than the medical me. Um, and I'd say that writing, and in fact, the existence of this prize from the reading last year has actually really helped me to do that. Thank you so much. And it's really interesting. And I'm really glad that the prize of the last year was able to have that impact and could be, can take part in the moving forward. What are your poetry plans next? Well, I uh, got a very dark joke with my wife because I was telling her, you know, what I was going to have to talk about today. And she said, well, clearly your first aim was, uh, you know, don't die. And your next plans are keep on not dying. 
um, and that is really dark, but it is true. Um, but really, being alive as fully as I can involves keeping writing. Um, and I'm really pleased that what I'm writing about has expanded more into writing about time generally. So my sense of time is changing, uh, partly because I've been reading about extinctions over geological time in relation to the world situation. And I've been meditating a lot and reading some Zen texts. So I'm working on a series of poems about what it might mean to be in time. Um, and some of those poems are actually already out in Northern Gravy, a Sheffield outfit, so shout out to them. Um, and some of the others are inspired by Alice Roberts' book, uh, Ancestors, which is about genetics and forensic archaeology, uh, exploring human attitudes to burials, so our kind of sense of self over time. So those are the main things I'm doing. But I also have a sequence that's left over from this pamphlet, um, and that is involving the god Apollo, because uh, he was the god of poetry and music, prophecy, illness and healing, and the sun. And that makes him kind of Mr. Melanoma, really. Uh, and his form, when he used to appear, according to the ancient Greeks, was in a mouth. Um, and I am working on transforming him into a character with his own series, uh, maybe in mouse form. So that promises to be uh, thoroughly ridiculous. So not very much then, I say jokingly, <laughs> given that you very much have your hands full with all of that. And I'm really looking forward to the idea of things that are thoroughly ridiculous. I think being able to play and be playful is so important in poetry. And yet somehow, certainly for me, one of the hardest things to learn. And good luck with the continuing to not die plan. It will definitely be good for your poetry career. Thank you. And thank it's you both right. very much. I have made work on a similar set of themes at various points. Um, and so thank you, I say, wrapping up to all the poets who entered, and especially those you've heard from today. You can find out more about the long-listed and short-listed poets' work on the Spread the Word and Disabled Poets Prize websites. And we are really delighted to announce that through the, through the continued sponsorship and support of ALCS, the prize will be opening again for submissions in 2025, helping us to reach more disabled poets and provide more opportunities to nurture their writing, artistry and audiences. If you are able to support the prize through a donation, you can do so through the prize website and it would be greatly appreciated. Many thanks to everyone who has come along today to the poems, to the poets who've read the work, and indeed thanks to the poems that have stuck with the judges so much. Thank you to Lynn and Michelle for their excellent interpreting as always. And the last and largest thank you must go to Spread the Word, who are the engine that keeps this prize progressing. So thank you for your continued support and belief in disabled creatives and in the prize. I wish everybody a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.